Undyne hit the ground at an angle, tumbling over and over until she struck the wall of her house. She landed in a senseless heap. Papyrus skidded to a halt at her side and fell to his knees, tears streaming down his face. Oh god, oh god, oh god. He'd been afraid this would happen. Undyne! His hands shook. Her arm was folded under her at an unnatural angle, but he was afraid to move her in case he hurt her worse. Blood trickled from her slack mouth, stained her white tank. Oh my god, he moaned. What did I do? He wanted nothing more than to bind his magic up tightly so it couldn't do any more damage, but Undyne needed help. The worst of her wounds was the gaseous attack had put in her chest. Carefully, Papyrus peeled the sticky fabric away, fighting down nausea. She'd been more or less split open, a large messy tear of ragged scales and flesh running between her breasts from collarbones to the base of her ribcage. A sliver of her sternum peeked out from under the shredded muscle, and thank God it had held. Blood and raw magic oozed from the wound. Tugging his gloves off, Papyrus pressed his hands against Undyne's chest, shuddering at the warm slickness of blood and meat. Undyne's magic prickled against the bones of his hands, and he poured as much of his own magic into his healing spell as he could muster. She needed more than the first aid he was able to give her. His spell was the equivalent of filling a bathtub with a water glass in the face of her injuries. This must be a nightmare. There was no way this was really happening. Undyne slowly unraveling under his hands, and him helpless to do anything about it. The most he could do on his own was delay the inevitable. Papyrus took one hand from the wound and fumbled for his phone. He struggled to dial the number, bloody digits sliding on the smooth plastic. He counted the rings while he watched magic slip out from under his other hand, glittering and pretty in contrast to the gore, but no less lethal if Undyne didn't get real medical attention soon. At the last ring before it went to voicemail, his brother picked up. Yeah? His voice held that gravelly crackle that betrayed he'd been napping on the job. Sands! Papyrus tried not to yell, but it was hard enough to form words. Undyne's hurt. I don't know anyone here and I can't leave her and she needs a doctor and- Whoa, whoa, whoa. Sans interrupted, instantly awake. Slow down, Papyrus. What happened? Ah, I hit her, Sans. I hit her way too hard. I didn't mean- I didn't mean to. It got away from me and- Papyrus cut himself off. Hysterical babbling wasn't helping. Sh she needs a doctor, and I have to stay and keep healing her, he said, forcing the words to line up neatly. Sans, I... I can't keep up with it. On the other end of the line, Sans cursed. Okay, he said. I know someone in Waterfall who should be able to help. Just sit tight, bro. You want me to stay on with you? Papyrus shook his head, then realized his brother couldn't see the motion. No, he said. I need to concentrate. Please, please hurry. She's leaking really fast. He let the phone drop and pressed his hand back onto the wound, redoubling his efforts to stem the outflow of magic and blood. After the longest 15 minutes of his life, Papyrus heard running footsteps outside Undyne's cave. He looked over his shoulder to find an elderly tortoise monster jogging toward them, a satchel slung over one shoulder and clattering against a shell. Sans wasn't far behind. Later, Papyrus would wonder how Sans had got from Snowden to Waterfall so fast, but right now the only thoughts in his head were about Undyne. <sighs> Damn youngins, the old man grumbled, gently shoving Papyrus out of the way. Think they're invincible, slinging magic around like it ain't no never mind. Papyrus stumbled to his feet and gave the oldster some room to work. He watched, trembling and exhausted, as the old man struck up a healing spell that put his own to shame. Hey, Sans said, 
touching Papyrus's arm and making him jump. You okay? Papyrus tore his gaze away from Undyne's unconscious body. I don't know how. It happened so fast. I know, bro. I know. Sans picked up Papyrus' gloves and blood-streaked phone up off the ground and put them in his jacket pocket. Let's sit, huh? Papyrus dropped heavily onto the ground, and Sans sat down beside him. He looked at the rut his runaway attack had left in the stone floor of the cave, pointing like an arrow to where Undyne was sprawled on the ground, and burst into tears again. Sans pulled him into a hug. <laughs> I almost killed her. Papyrus clung to his brother for dear life, sobbing into the collar of his jacket. Oh, oh my god, I almost killed her. Sans stroked the back of his neck, murmuring soothing nonsense while Papyrus cried. It's okay now, he said, after a few minutes. It's okay. Gerson's gonna fix it, okay? She'll be fine. <laughs> What if she's not? Papyrus was inconsolable. He had known something like this would happen. Why had he walked right into it anyway? What kind of idiot did that? I never should have. I shouldn't have. He stammered, hiccuping. <laughs> I'm so stupid. No, you're not, San said firmly. A sudden thought hit Papyrus. One more small, stupid thing. Oh no, he said, letting go of his brother. I I'm getting blood on your jacket. I don't care about the stupid jacket. Sans pulled back, gripping Papyrus' shoulders. His face was stern. I care about you. What happened? Papyrus took a few shaky breaths. We were sparring, he said, when he pulled himself together sufficiently to talk without crying. He gestured helplessly at the rut in the stone. My attack misfired, his voice quavered, just thinking about it. The sight of Undyne crumpled on the ground would stay with him forever. He'd done that. Wow, San said, sounding more concerned than anything. And that? He pointed at the crack in the far wall. Earlier this week, Papyrus said miserably. After a lengthy pause, San said quietly. And your arm? Papyrus rubbed at the healed bones distractedly. Recoil, he lied. Sans's frown deepened. How long has this been going on? Papyrus shrugged. Horror was edging into numbness. He was too tired. Weeks, he said. It doesn't happen all the time. Sans hummed thoughtfully, putting two and two together. Well, putting two and another two together. So, he said, when you're skiving off of your night shift, you're trying to figure out he waved an arm at the scars in the rock. This? Papyrus nodded. That wasn't a lie. Not really. He really was trying to rein in his magic. It was just difficult when most of his attention was focused on staying alive. I can see why you didn't want the teens sniffing around that hill, then. The old man, Gerson, touched Papyrus's shoulder. Papyrus hadn't noticed him move, and flinched under the scaly hand. Easy, son, Gerson said, not unkindly. Help me get her inside, won't you? I'm not as strong as I used to be. Papyrus nodded weakly and stood. Undyne was still out, but she was more or less whole. Dried blood matted her hair and caked her lips, and her tank was beyond saving. Other than that, and the dressing Gerson had wrapped around her chest, there was little sign of how badly off she'd been. Careful not to disturb the dressing, Papyrus picked her up, 
one arm supporting her back and the other scooped under her knees. She was surprisingly heavy, but then again, there was a lot more to her than bones. Papyrus adjusted his grip. He could manage. Gerson opened the door for him, and he carried Undyne inside the house, laying her gently on her bed. He could feel the old man watching him as he removed Undyne's boots and pulled one of the blankets over her. Thank you for coming so quickly, Papyrus said, feeling like he should say something. You saved her. You did a good job of keeping her going until I got here, Gerson said. Papyrus frowned. I'm the reason she got hurt in the first place. Gerson chuckled, a rusty, dry sound. <laughs> oh, she'll be all right, he said. I've known that girl since she was just a small fry. She's tough as nails and reckless, he added. But I'm sure you know that. Tell me, he said, peering up at Papyrus. I overheard you talking. What were you feeling when your magic went wild? Do you remember? Papyrus met the old man's roomy eyes. Um, he said. I'm sorry, but I don't remember. It's a blur. That's all right, son. Gerson scratched at his chin with blunted claws. You know, the same thing happened to me back in the day. Really? Papyrus was already grateful to the old man for healing Undyne. The news that he wasn't suffering alone like some kind of freak had him ready to adopt Gerson into the family. Gerson nodded. It wasn't unusual during the war. Not unusual at all. Our magic is part of us, son. And if things get bad enough, it starts to react on its own. He shrugged and gave Papyrus a disturbingly knowing look. This was the part where the old man started asking questions and where Papyrus would have to deflect and lie and generally be a garbage person. To Papyrus's surprise, Gerson sighed turning away to line up some of the medicines and supplies from his satchel on Undyne's bedside table. I don't know you, he said. I don't know your life, and it's not my place to tell you what to do. Just know that it won't get better on its own. That's all I have to say on the matter. Thank you, Papyrus said and meant it. I'll think about it. Gerson patted his arm absently. Good man. Now go wash up. Sands was rummaging through the kitchen cupboards. He gave Papyrus a wan smile when he got close. Hey. You know your way around Undyne's kitchen, right? Where does she keep her tea? Covered to the left of the fridge, Papyrus said, turning on the tap and letting the water warm up. Bottom shelf. Thanks, bro. Uh, ah, there it is. Sands grabbed the tin and set it on the counter. He already had the kettle on. It was ticking softly on the burner as the water heated. Mugs? Papyrus held his hands under the warm water hoping for the blood to soften up. It had gotten down between the joints. Second cupboard from the stove, he said. Sand seemed to sense the fog Papyrus was in, and kindly wasn't trying to pull him out of it. The questions required just enough thought to keep him from getting totally lost, and no more. Ah. Uh. The blood flaked off reluctantly, even with soap. The bones of Papyrus' hands felt smooth, but there were plenty of tiny grooves and nicks where a liquid could get good and stuck once it dried. He wanted nothing more than to take the vegetable brush and scrub it all off, but that would ruin the brush. Between the cave wall and floor, the training dummy, and Undyne herself, 
Papyrus was of the mind that he'd ruined enough of her things. Ah, oh, what? Sans glared down into the tea tin. Loose leaf? I wouldn't have pegged on dying for a tea snob. Papyrus shut the water off, dried his hands, and grabbed the teapot off the top of the fridge. Thanks, bro. Sans took the teapot from him and dropped some leaves in it. Oh, bone china, he said. Aren't we fancy? He glanced at Papyrus, but didn't comment on the total lack of reaction. While the tea steeped, Sans dug Papyrus's gloves and phone out of his pocket and handed them over. Thank you. His hands weren't totally clean, but that would have to wait until they got home. For now, he felt immensely better with his gloves back on. He wiped as much of the blood off the phone as he could manage and put it away. The tea helped. A little. Sans had put too much sugar in it, but Papyrus finished it off quickly regardless. The three of them sat around Undyne's kitchen table, Sans and Gerson carrying on a light conversation over Papyrus's head, which he was resting on the table, pillowed on his arms, for what that was worth. Now that he'd gotten something in his system, it was hard to stay awake. He'd spent a lot of magic today. You should take him home, Gerson said to Sans. Make him rest. Papyrus raised his head with an effort. This was the second time today people were talking about him, and he didn't need it. I'd rather stay, he said. He wanted to be here when Undyne woke up. He needed to see that she was okay, and to apologize. There's nothing more you can do here. Gerson took a swig from his mug, his beak-like mouth clicking against the ceramic. Trust me, son. She'll be embarrassed enough when she comes round without you making sad eyes at her. You just leave it to me. Sans stood, picking up his and Papyrus' empty mugs and carrying them to the sink. You heard the man, Papyrus. He's practically a grandpa. He doesn't mind. Gerson nodded. I don't. Besides, <laughs> the shop was slow today, he said, chuckling. There was no sense arguing with both of them. Resigned, Papyrus hauled himself to his feet. After a final assurance from Gerson, he let Sans take his arm and half steer, half support him as they left. Papyrus barely remembered the ferry ride back to Snowdon or the walk through town to the house. He showered and changed his clothes in a daze, and collapsed into bed, where he slept hard for several hours. His dreams were unpleasant. <laughs>